Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Ghosts of the Woods, European Wildcats, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Andrea Serena. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you very much. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. All right, so let's start. A bit about myself. Okay. So, I've been a nature guide for about eight years now. I work in very different environments from the coastal to the alpine ones, uh, but with greater specialization towards the, uh, let's say, high altitude habitat. Um, I'm also a Dolomites National Park guide. So let's say mountains are uh, my comfort zone. Um, I also teach environmental education in schools, right now at primary, and of course I'm more than proud to be an expedition leader as well for uh, NETA uh, since 2019. But let's focus now on this fantastic animal, uh, the European wildcat. Um, its binomial nomenclature is Felis sylvestris sylvestris. So Felis is the genus, sylvestris the species, and sylvestris again the subspecies. But we will understand this better later on. Um, this beautiful animal has a robust, agile body. As we can see, a short and rounded head, strong uh, and long legs, um, especially the rear ones. Uh, the fur is thick and soft, grayful in color, uh, lighter on the belly with dark, with dark um, transverse bands. Uh, with some typical and very characteristic blackish rings decorating the tail. Um, as you can see clearly um, on the right picture in this slide. Um, beautiful cat. Characteristic is uh, um, the dark dorsal band. We can admire it here in this beautiful picture that also um, tells us how uh, its fur is uh, suitable for camouflage and perfect for not being noticed among the vegetation. Um, okay, let's see how big this beautiful wildcat is. Um, with of course, males in this case always bigger than females. So we have a body length um, up to 2.6 feet, that together a tail length up to 1.3 feet gives a maximum body length of almost 4 feet. Um, its weight can vary greatly from four, 4.5 pounds up to 17, sometimes 18 pounds. Um, we said that the male is bigger than the female. And here we can have a good example um, with this amazing couple where of course we have 
the male on the right, which is heavier and bigger. Not that much, but we can clearly um, see that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we are here. We can also see a comparison on the right between uh, the wild cat skull and a domestic cat skull, with the second clearly smaller, and on the left, how um, the wild cat skull and teeth are with the uh, canines and. Uh, Premorals particularly uh, develop perfect for killing and perfect for tearing the prey. Okay, so uh, the European white cat is on average bigger and stouter than the domestic cat. Uh, domestic cat that has around 50, more or less 50 different breeds and can have many different colors, unlike the white one. Um, we see here a few examples. We have this beautiful uh, European white cat in the middle and then all his cousins around it. Um, beautiful. Of course, domestic cats breeds come all from wild cat uh, species and subspecies, right? Um, and so from the European, um, but as well from the African wild cat and the Asiatic wild cats. But if we have to choose one domestic cat, the one that more looks like the wild cat, with no doubt uh, we mentioned the tabby cat, um, term with which we consider any domestic cat with that distinctive M, that M shape marking on its forehead. And that's a clear distinctive sign that remind us of, uh, mm, let's say, its, it's wild cousin. Um, the tabby with the most similar coloring to that of the wild cat is surely the uh, mackerels, <clears throat> the, most, uh, the most common among the tabbies. Uh, here in this slide, we can see how this domestic cat uh, on the right looks very similar to the white cat because, again, the famous M and especially its striped body and colors. Um, important, the tabby is not a breed of cat, um, but uh, a coat type seen in almost all genetic lines of domestic cats, regardless of breed. <clears throat> um, beautiful. The tabby pattern is found in many official cat breeds and is um, extremely common among the general population of uh, mixed breed cats around the world, mm, both long or short haired cats, as you can see again here. All right. And so now, what about? the habitat of this gorgeous mammal. Um, well, to know the environment of this animal, we can go straight to the title of this presentation, Ghost of the Boots. So why 
the white cat is considered the cost of the woods. Uh, because for sure, this is one of the most um, elusive white animals present in nature in our latitudes. Um, in fact, the white cat is very, very difficult to spot in its natural habitat. Mm, the low densities and the small size, as well as the um, predilection for wooded and bushy areas, um, the rocky areas and slopes that are not uh, accessible to humans make it uh, a true ghost. All right. Um, so what can we say about its diet and the hunting methodology of the European white cat? Um, first of all, hunting sight and hearing are the white cat's primary weapons. The, the white cat is a very patient predator. It can wait for hours until to spot a valid prey, um, hours and hours. Then once ready to attack, the white cat can make jumps of up to nine, 10 feet, precise and almost infallible. Um, then when necessary, it can also, as you can see here, on the left, climb trees where it can find unattended bird nests um, with, of course, the aim of feeding on their eggs, which are very high in protein. Uh, this is um, common, uh, especially during um, late spring, beginning of summer, for example. It is uh, for sure a, a voracious hunter who can ingest up to 600 grams of 20 to 22 pounds of meat per day. And that's a lot, consider uh, the size of this animal. And this cat can hunt in different environmental situations. So from the top of the trees to uh, dense vegetation or from open ground to um, sometimes attacking prey directly uh, in the water. Uh, of course, it's if close, if the cat is close to the bank, um, and the prey is close to the bank and easy to catch, um, we see an example in, in the photo at the bottom left of uh, this slide with this um, European white cat trying to catch a frog. Obviously, uh, more in general, we're talking about exceptions, right? Uh, in fact, this uh, feline is, is, is not an active swimmer at all. Um, but it can happen. Um, normally, this cat preys on small mammals, so wild rabbits, hares, uh, and lots of different uh, species of uh, rodents. Um, it also preys the dormouse, um, the squirrel, the nutria and many, uh, many kind of birds, especially ducks and especially um, waterfowl birds, um, as well as galliforms, pigeons, uh, passerines, etc. Um, the prey you can see at the top right is an uh, Eurasian jay, uh, for example. <clears throat> um, if necessary, 
this cat can also uh, eat reptiles and insects as well. And especially during the winter, we see this in the central peak. Um, the white cat can feed on carriums um, with a roe deer in this picture as example. Beautiful pictures, by the way. Um, always uh, regarding heating habits, um, sometimes the white cat observes the depredation of other hunters in the middle of the woods. And uh, if the competitor is smaller in size and generally not too dangerous for the white cat, he can easily steal his prey. Uh, as we see uh, in this very interesting camera trap sequence, with these uh, individuals stealing a um, uh, hare previously hunted by this amazing uh, gazok, beautiful bird. <clears throat> In this case, um, this white cat took all the necessary time to calm and clean up the carcass, returning several times to feed on the stolen prey for uh, a couple of days, um, making sure to to take care to hide the, the the prey, stolen prey. Every time the cat moved away from it, using uh, you can see um, the leaves that were around uh, uh, the hair. Um, we can see it in the bottom right picture here. Uh, this is a very, very interesting uh, sequence. It's, it's not easy to 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 collect data, infos, uh, videos, uh, photos about this uh, feline. Is uh, now technolo technology are helping us a lot, but a uh, sequence like this um, is not very common. So it's very, very nice. Um, but what about the white cat's behavior now? Let's see. Um, well, European white cats are, and in general, uh, white cats are mostly um, solitary and uh, nocturnal animals. Um, more or less they had an 80 percent nocturnal behavior with um peaks of activity between 10 p.m and 4 a.m in the morning uh, being mainly active on the darkest night um reducing the activity in bright moonlight nights and that's because uh, uh because the predator um which are nocturnal uh just like um this species but we see some predator later on it's, it's not easy to catch this this cat but a couple of predator can do it um anyway um of course um this cat has another 20 percent diurnal activity but only in areas with zero or little human presence. Um, what about the territory? Mm, territorial marking consists of uh, urinating on trees, vegetation, um, rocks, and depositing droppings in many places around its territory. Um, the white cat may also scratch trees, leaving, uh, of course, visual markers, and leaving, leaving as well its um, scent through plants that are in its paws. Mm, it's a very territorial animal, by the way. <clears throat> 
white cat does not dig its own burrows, but takes refuge in um, the cavities of old trees or fallen trees, then in cracks in rocks in general, and um, also in abandoned nests or dens of uh, other animals. Mm, for example, heron nests and abandoned fox or badger dance um, is perfect for it. Um, now, let's see what can be said about its reproduction. Um, first of all, wild cats are uh, polygamous. So when a female is ready to mate, uh, males in the area um, gather near her and compete for her. Um, the white cat has an estrous beef period from December to February, more or less, and then another one from May to July, so twice a year. Nice couple, by the way. <clears throat> uh, the gestation period lasts for a couple of months, sometimes a bit more. So let's say between 60 and 68, 70 days. And liters range in size from one to seven kittens. Um, then the young start hunting alongside their mother when they are a couple of months old, 60 days old. And after more or less five months, uh, we'll begin to move independently. Um, and already very good predator, I would say. So, Kittens are more or less fully grown at 10 months, despite skeletal grow continuous for at least 18, 19 months. Um, the family group breaks up after about five months when the young cats go off to find new territories for themselves. Um, females in general become reproductively mature when they are six months old, uh, more like six, seven months old. Okay, so distribution of the European white cat. What can we say? Um, let's say they, Let's see first where the European white cat lives, and then we will see as well where the other white cats subspecies are found around the world. Uh, of course, we always focus on the Felis sylvestri species. Um, so, as you can see from this map, this uh, feline is native to continental Europe. And then Scotland, Turkey, and the Caucasus region that face the uh, Caspian Sea. <clears throat> if we imagine to be an European white cat and to start a journey on foot, um, let's say starting from the easternmost point of our ranch to the westernmost point, we will have to walk more or less. 3,800 miles. So from Baku, Lisbon in Portugal, and that's a long way. But let's discover the areas of the other white cat subspecies. Also to understand better what we mean with white cat. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So the generic term white cat um, refers to felines belonging to the Felis genus and Sil Felis sylvestris species with a wide distribution also in Africa um, as well as we see in Europe and Asia, um, within which it is possible to recognize <clears throat> five main subspecies that have in common, of course, the genus Felis. So we see here the Felis sylvestris sylvestris, which is our lovely European white cat, then the Felis sylvestris ornata, the Asiatic, in this case, white cat, to go down to the Felis sylvestris BAT. <clears throat> interesting because, and this is the Chinese mountain cat, by the way, uh, interesting because once considered a uh, species apart, but in fact, um, that's a white cat subspecies. Then Felis sylvestris cafra, um, which is the central southern Africa white cat. And finally, the Feli Silvestris Libica, found in Africa and Middle East. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay, let's see one by one these amazing, beautiful animals. So, Number one, <clears throat> this is the European white cat. And <clears throat> um, first thing we see here is the power of those legs, very long legs, consider its body. And that's also um, what makes different between this cat and its domestic cousin. <clears throat> Then number two, okay, um, the Asiatic white cat. Then the Chinese mountain cat, and uh, this cat has a very small range. Um, the species is endemic to the. Uh, Tibetan plateau, uh, so we are in western China, uh, meaning that we can find these species only in that, uh, mm, let's say, small, but yeah, in general, small area. Uh, another true ghost, because it's very, very, very difficult to spot this one as well. Then, uh, number four, beautiful the southern african white cat with this picture taken at the kruger national park uh, by the way you might be lucky enough <clears throat> while traveling over there with neta maybe to spot one considering that if i remember well one of the guides there for neta is richard uh, which is a great person but great guide and great photographer and Richie is always ready to find the right spot and right subject for some unforgettable photography and to bring home uh, a picture of um, the southern african white cat let me say will be a good trophy <clears throat> finally uh number five last but not least African white cat. Uh, hmm. And this fella is probably the most interesting one. Why? Uh, different reason, but first of all, because this is the species which, uh, let's say, started that um, evolutionary line that gave us today the domestic cat known to us all. <clears throat> so uh, let's jump into our time machine and to better understand domestic cats. So the earliest 
epidemic of wildcat domestication comes from <clears throat> an incredible 9,500 year old Neolithic grave. Um, um, a grave excavated in the island of Cyprus. So you can see from the map we are um, in the Mediterranean, um, easternmost point of the Mediterranean. Um, amazing discovery. Uh, the grave contained the skeleton of both a human and a cat laying one next to each other, as you can see in this three-dimensional reconstruction. <clears throat> uh, this discovery um, combined with a uh, lot of genetic studies suggest the experts that cats were probably first domesticated in uh, the Middle East around, uh, around the early days of agriculture and then they were brought to Cyprus and then to Egypt. <clears throat> so let's go to Egypt. It is believed that the cat um, began to be domesticated in Egypt starting from uh, 3000 BC, more or less. Uh, but for the ancient Egyptians, um, cats were not just uh, pets, you know, but they were considered um, sacred, um, very important animal, um, so much that after death, uh, they received all the honors and uh, funerary ceremony. Probably only the um, pharaohs and high priests were treated better than cats in uh, uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, things changed a lot. Um, okay, <clears throat> uh, now let's see um, what are the natural enemies of this animal. So, Zoologists and biologists have clearly understood that an adult wildcat is, uh, uh, is a very difficult, uh, too difficult prey for any predator in general. And uh, adult, <clears throat> adult uh, individuals usually only have to fear predators such as the lynx or the wolf, but the situation changed uh, considerably. If we are talking about uh, kittens, about newborn, about very young cats, um, which instead become very precious uh, prey for many, many predators in the wood. Um, and we can see some uh, some of them here in this slide. So, uh, for example, the red fox, uh, the marten on the top left, um, the owl, and um, the short-tailed weasel, the beautiful short-tailed weasel. <clears throat> but apart from natural enemies, what has the greatest impact on the wildcat population. What are the major um, threats factors? Let's see. So wildcats have been um, threatened in the past due to fur trade and from killings linked to predation on Farming yard animals, um, 
talking about chickens, rabbits, uh, etc. Uh, then individuals who approach homes can also be victims of illegal killings, uh, mostly caused by poison or traps that uh, often are intended for other species uh, deemed, uh, let's say, harmful. Um, anyway, in Europe, the wildcat uh, threats include um, especially habitat fragmentation, um, loss of habitat, first of all, uh, forest environments, of course, and then um, exposure to toxic um, agricultural chemicals and um, of course um, and unfortunately from disease transmission by domestic cats <clears throat> and talking about domestic cats there's <clears throat> another huge problem for the white cat that connect us um, as well to our important partner WWF. So let's see what we're talking about and <coughs> sorry tonight is like um sorry about that. And what we're talking about um and what more in general uh WWF is doing right now regarding the European white cat. So um, WWF, but all researchers in general, fully agree <clears throat> on the fact that um, the greatest danger for these wild species is hybridation with, of course, the domestic cat. Um, basically, um, scientists are telling us that in 200, 300 years, uh, a poultry time in evolutionary terms, um, hybridation will lead to the um, irreversible genetic replacement of of, um, <clears throat> of white cats, and so making it impossible to uh, distinguish them from their domestic cousins. And this is what happened already. Uh, in countries such as Scotland, for example, where uh, the main problem is that at the moment, the, the majority of living wildcats there are um, hybrids. Um, so let's say that the pure Scottish wildcat is <clears throat> Uh, functionally extinct. Um, you know, there are too few specimens for the population to be viable. But let's be positive and let's see if the breeding programs and the uh, releases into the wild of pure genetic wildcats will <clears throat> change things. And uh, if they will bring back to 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 the Scottish Islands these um, this animal and its pure genetics, they are doing great. Uh, breeding programs are running very well. Um, let's see. Um, some luck will be needed, but uh, they are working very well. Fingers crossed. So, in short, the only solution is to find a way to block uh, the crossbreed. Uh, <clears throat> so, acting on the number of the individuals and their hybridation rate. So, what's suggested by um, scientists is to drastically reduce the opportunities for um, fertilization on the 
edges of white cats territories um how by randomly sterilizing domestic females uh, which are uh, frequently found near farms or forest <clears throat> places of incursion by maize white cats also in this slide we can clearly see in smaller picture um, um, morphological anomaly uh, connected to the inbreeding um, called um, the king tail which is um, evident deviation of the tail um, that in extreme cases can lead to um, brachuria um, which is a partial or sometimes total loss of the tail and that's not a big problem for our domestic cats but a huge huge problem for their white cousins um, because tail is very very important for a for a white cat especially um, during the hunting um, for um, for the cat's balance <coughs> Another very interesting study um, and research in which WWF also participates is the uh, monitoring and genetic study of the wildcat on the uh, Mediterranean island of Sardinia. <clears throat> so um, that's a very, very small population of uh, cat it's very rare but very peculiar and has always been considered an ecotype of african white cat uh, brought there to sardinia by the phoenicians so starting from more or less the 8th century bc mm, but now these zoologists thanks to the latest genetic studies, seems to agree that this is a new subspecies of white cat. And for the moment, they are calling it Felis Silvestris Sarda, of course, that comes from the island Sardinia. Um, let's see, but that's almost official. So uh, here we have our sixth subspecies of um, Felis Silvestri is beautiful. <clears throat> now, um, I would like to take advantage of this webinar to do um, a brief focus on the domestic cat. Um, I'll give you some very worrying data uh, to make us all. Uh, realize how sometimes domestic animals can be mm, harmful to biodiversity. I'm talking about the shocking number of uh, wild animals killed every year by house cats or um, feral cats. So the situation is um, I would say dramatic um, and it's dramatic all over the world <clears throat> but I will give you first some numbers that come directly from US studies so <clears throat> researchers from conservation and uh, biology institutes and um, the US um, Fish and Wildlife Service estimate a total number of animals that have been killed by domestic and feral cats in the United States. So the number are mind boggling. Um, 3.7 billion birds 
and uh, 20.7 billion small mammals are killed by our feline friends every year. That's in the States. Um, impressive. Um, here in this slide, we see um, these domestic cats uh, killing birds, but it is the same with any kind of uh, vertebrates. Uh, let's see. Here, for example, um, the preys are all uh, reptiles. Um, as we said, um, the situation is problematic all over. Uh, lately, uh, Australian government voted for the uh, cat containment law, which introduced the, um, the first restriction for domestic cats to, to prevent them from escaping the control of their owners uh, and so to become feral. <clears throat> and these include tighter restriction for domestic cats, such as um, for example uh, keeping them indoors at night helps a lot and uh, also limiting the number of cats that uh, um, a family can own uh, the decision was made after they realized that in a single day um, australia's millions of domestic cats kill approximately 1.3 million birds, 1.8 million reptiles, and over 3.1 million mammals in one day. <clears throat> wow. All right. Okay, so uh, this is New Zealand. Uh, sorry for the sad picture on the left but um, well we all love animals here but um, we face reality uh, here we have a, a feral cat and some of the remains of 107 dead um, very endangered short-tailed bats in New Zealand uh, the bats were found at the base of a um, bat roost tree and stashed around in piles uh, during the time that that cat was um, active. New Zealand has one of the highest cat uh, ownership rates in the world, um, maybe the highest. Um, consider that almost half of all households in New Zealand have at least one cat and 20% of them have more than two. So many are the emergencies around that country uh, regarding this problem. For example, on Auckland Island, feral cats have contributed to the global or local extinction of more than 29 bird species. Um, evidence suggests only 13 of the 38 native bird species remain on Auckland Island. And uh, uh, this is just one case. Another interesting thing um, is what the New Zealand researchers tell us regarding the brutal toxoplasmosis. So uh, cats can transmit the, the parasite. The parasite is uh, called toxoplasma. Uh, they can transmit this to, to sheep, to humans, and of course, to the native wildlife. And incredible, they discovered that when this Cats' feces containing these parasites get into um, water runoff. It can cause the death of both Hector's dolphins 
and the critically endangered Mahui dolphins we can see here on the right. And that's incredible. <clears throat> it's incredible. Um, close the discussion about the problems of the domestic cat towards biodiversity. Here is this image <clears throat> from Nagio, where we can see 232 animals killed by house cats in just one year. And all uh, these animals were brought to a random wild care animal hospital uh, back in 2019. Uh, this make you think. Um, it's incredible. Well, now um, let's go back to our amazing, gorgeous white cat and let's quickly discover together where we might have chances to, to, to spot one, to spot a white cat while uh, traveling with Natab. <clears throat> so I marked in the red some of the destination where some of the subspecies of the genus Valis uh, we saw today uh, live. So um, starting from Europe, we have the Scotland trip and the Slovenian and Croatian trip to move then down to Africa, where I marked several net app strips such as the South African, the Namibian, um, the Kenyan Tanzania trips. And finally, let's move to Asia with the Indian trip and the Himalayan Indian trip that can give us a chance as well. Um, about the Himalayas, a place I love. Let me say, <clears throat> Uh, talking about different genus, but same amazing beauty. Remember, but regarding bigger cats, that Netab makes an uh, amazing trip uh, to, the, to the Himalayas to, to spot the snow leopard. And I'm saying that because that by far my favorite animal. So yeah, truly fantastic. Um, and I think we are done with our beauty. So uh, thank you all. I hope you like the, the webinar, but especially these amazing white cats. I, I really, really hope you will have the chance to spot them. I was lucky enough and trust me, biggest goosebumps ever. Um, I thank you again. And if you have any question, um, more than happy to answer. Thank you very, very much. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's ask some questions. So what do we know what the current size of the European wildcat population is? Um. To be honest, uh, uh, the number is, um, scientists are not sure. Someone told us about um, 300,000 uh, cats. Um, I mean, total population. Um, some biologists suggest they are maybe 400,000. Um, I think those are, maybe two positive numbers uh the population is um is not increasing much um some are rising like for example in scotland apparently the situation is getting better but in general this animal um is facing huge problem mostly regarding the loss of habitat i would say uh, in total, um, more or less, let's be positive, uh, 400,000 um, in total. 
So what is the average lifespan of the European wildcat? Um, let's say between 12 and 16 years. Um, this is, um, this depends of the habitat um, and of course, uh, um the praise of the animal if a male or a female uh had enough food and live in a in a good situation so a nice environment no stress at all and um i mean an happy animal sometimes they can reach 15 16 years i would say um 12, 13 is, um, is a normal uh, lifespan for this uh, feline. So are they all over Europe? And in what country would you find the highest concentration of wildcats? Uh, unfortunately, now they are not. Um, the countries with uh, the bigger numbers are right now um portugal and spain and apparently the alpine population is uh is increasing could you ever tame a wild cat or should you not even try sorry can you repeat could you ever tame a wild cat or should you not even try huh. um I'm going to be super honest. I saw my very, very, very first European wildcat uh, during this um, uh, summer season. And that was uh, a gift that lasts probably three seconds. So until now, I, I don't have even the chance to, to think about what to do in case of uh, wildcat spotting, but uh, that was the biggest emotion ever. I say that every time I see a new animal, to be honest, but uh, yeah, it's still almost a ghost for me as well. Are there any protections in uh, place for the wildcats? Um, well, uh, all the, in general, all the environments and the known habitats where, uh, we can collect proof of the presence of the cat, um, they become straight away protected areas if they are not, um, uh, before, um, before give the information. Then, uh, there are few, but only few um specific uh conservation and breeding center around europe um probably um the best ones right now are in scotland and as we said before they are doing a great great job and apparently the islands um will have their kings back soon great thank you so is there a specific type of terrain that the wild cats prefer to be in? Um, it depends. Um, the European subspecies uh, love uh, uh, very dense vegetation. Uh, the forest must be rich on trees and with some little open areas. Um, but for example, if we move um already to the caucasus region uh cats are found in very open uh environments uh, um, let's say sometimes more similar to their african cousin that to uh the same subspecies that live uh, um in the european forest i mean the western european forest um I would say uh, mature old forests are uh, the key for this animal. But uh, if we change subspecies and we jump into the Asiatic wildcat or African wildcat, 
the habitat change completely. Uh, um, but yeah, we are focusing on the European one and, you know, mature dense forest for sure. Uh, do wildcats ever hunt in groups or in pairs? Um, no. Um, sometimes um, uh, the females, um, while they are trying to teach the kittens to select prey, sometimes they can, let's say, hunt together, but in fact, the females is the hunter and the kittens just uh, follow her like it, it's more a game for that no they follow the female but that's a, a game situation they are playing uh, with the mother and with the prey uh, adult cats prey alone and um, will be uh, will be amazing to see two of them uh um attacking the same prey so i would say no great well thank you so much for addressing those questions unfortunately that's going to be the last one that we do have time for today so i would like to throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us today uh well um i would like to to thank uh our guest to to join our webinars. Um, this is uh, fantastic for us. And is uh, sometimes it feels like uh, this is a new way to guide people around the world. Of course, we all prefer to be out there on the field, but this is very, very nice. And we do this thanks to our guests. So simply thank you. And I hope to see you again. Um, and yeah, have a nice day. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. <clears throat> and I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you could send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs>